um, let's get started. As you can tell, I am um, presenting from home today, uh, which involves a little bit of a change in technology. In particular, I'm recording with Zoom uh, instead of with uh, Panopto. However, as I promised you, your faces will not appear on the recordings and um, I will also be doing breakout rooms and during the breakout rooms um, when we're talking, I want you to feel very free to express yourselves and make mistakes. So I'll make sure that even your voices during that part don't appear. I'll just put text of what you say and not reveal your name so you don't have to hesitate to speak up. Um, I want to remind you that you have a problem set, which is due this Friday. It's about two thirds length. Um, and yeah, and then um, we will also have a problem set that's due on the final day of classes and that will be a normal length uh, problem set. So, um, so our guest scientist today is Elmer Imes, uh, who received his PhD from the University of Michigan. And he was the second black uh, person to receive a PhD in physics in the United States. His work uh, provided critical support for the quantum theory of molecular vibrations and rotations. And here's a quote from a well-known figure in that field. Imes's work formed a turning point in the scientific thinking, making it clear that quantum theory was not just a novelty useful in limited fields of physics, but of widespread and general application. So he's talking about the situation back in the 1920s and 1930s when quantum theory was still being developed and people didn't know if it was right. And they didn't know, does it apply to everything or only to these certain specific cases? And so Imes's work was, was really, really important in showing that quantum theory appeal, uh, applies to a very broad range of phenomena, including some of the stuff that we're going to study today. So um, last time, meaning just before break, we did the second example of conservation of angular momentum. So remember that I had previously caught the ball and I'm spinning around on a, a chair and we're modeling me as a cylinder. Um, and then I pull the mass into the center, which speeds up my rotation because as you'll recall, the, mo the angular momentum is I omega. And so by pulling the ball in, I reduce the moment of inertia i. And so if the angular momentum is to remain the same, that means omega has to get bigger. And we use that to show that the final kinetic energy is bigger than the initial kinetic energy. And that extra energy comes from the work that I do pulling the ball in against the centrifugal force. We also started talking, uh, talking about pressure, also known as hydrostatic pressure, which is the force per unit area from a fluid, meaning a gas or a liquid that presses perpendicular to all surfaces. And we described this experiment where you take gas in a sealed box and start cooling it down and eventually it liquefies. At that point, the pressure drops. But if you extrapolate that line down, no matter what gas you're using, whether it's hydrogen or nitrogen, whatever, they all extrapolate to the same point, which is absolute zero. And then we talked about the kinetic theory of gases in which we assume that the gas molecules are moving around randomly when they collide with the box wall, that it's an elastic collision, and the walls provide the forces needed to reverse the momentum of the molecule in the direction perpendicular to the surface of the box. And we use that to derive this equation, PV equals N times the average value of MV sub X squared. So questions about any of that? OK, so we are trying to make the connection between this equation that we derived last time and the ideal gas law. And that connection comes through something called the equipartition theorem. I am not going to prove this to you in this class. If you take PCAM or statistical mechanics, you'll learn more about it in those classes. But here, we're just going to take this as, uh, as something that we accept. What it states is that any term in the total energy of a system that is 
this is the sign for proportional to a velocity squared or a position squared has on average one half kbt of thermal energy but this is only true if k whoops kbt is much greater than the energy spacing between quantum levels So there's kind of a lot to unpack here. So we'll take our time and work through it. Uh, I, I don't expect you to understand every word in this right now, but hopefully by the end of this class, you will. This is a very important idea. So we're gonna give it three stars. It has an importance that goes way beyond this class. It applies in every realm of science. Um, so first let's talk about the KB that appears in here. I think we've talked about this before, but just to remind you, this is the Boltzmann constant and it has the value, just looking this up in the back of our book. Uh, yes, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Um, in the main other course that I'm teaching, students measured that Boltzmann constant by measuring the electrical noise from a resistor. Pretty cool experiment. Um, so next, let's talk about the thing that appears last in this, which is the energy spacing between quantum levels. You probably have seen in some previous course, either in high school or in college, how the energy levels of atoms, the electronic energy levels are quantized. So for example, for a hydrogen atom, we have a ground state, which is called the 1s, and then a first excited state, which is called the 2s. And if we're talking about a hydrogen atom, there's a single electron, which would normally be in the ground state. This is the way that we designate an electron with this kind of funny looking arrow. So this is showing that the electron is in that ground state, not in the more excited state. And the one difference between these two states is how the electron is distributed around the nucleus of the atom. So let's say in the 1s state, here's the nucleus, which is a proton. The electron is distributed around it in a sort of a spherical cloud like this, but it's, it's a sphere with kind of fuzzy edges like that. In the 2s state, it's also distributed around it in a spherical cloud, but it's a larger sphere like this. Um, so the energy spacing between these quantum states would be this. We could call this delta E electronic because this is a spacing between the electronic quantum states. And for hydrogen, this is about three electron volts. So an electron volt, you're gonna learn something more about this next semester when you study volts and study other properties of electricity and magnetism. But for our purposes, it's just 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So for comparison, if you take the Boltzmann constant times room temperature, so notice that the units of the Boltzmann constant are in joules per Kelvin. So when you multiply it by temperature, you get an amount of energy. Boltzmann constant times room temperature is about equal to 0 0.026 electron volts. The electron volt is a pretty small unit of energy, but it's a convenient one when you're talking about processes on the atomic scale. So if I were to try to indicate that on the scale of this diagram, so this would be about one EV, and I need something that's about a 40th of it. So it'd be sort of about that much. So that would be KBT room 
sort of too small to even see very well. And so in this case, we are clearly not in the limit where KBT is much greater than the energy spacing. In fact, KBT is much less than the energy spacing uh, in this case. So another way to think about that is that essentially for all of the hydrogen atoms of a gas of hydrogen in a box, the electrons are all in this ground state. None of them are up in this first excited state. And so it's more or less as if that first excited state doesn't exist. So there is no extra thermal energy associated with these electronic states in hydrogen because they're just spaced so far apart that all of the electrons are in the ground state. Questions so far? Okay, so now we're gonna use this. Um, so now let's go back to, to unpacking the equipartition theorem and talk about the first part of it, a term in the total energy that's proportional to a velocity squared or a position squared. And the best way to explain that part is to do an example. So let's go back to our um, kinetic theory of gases example. So here's the wall of the box. And here is a molecule which is bouncing off of the wall like this. If we think about that molecule, there is a kinetic energy of translation of the center of mass of the molecule. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the sort of inner workings of the molecule if it has more than one atom. But no matter how many atoms it has, the center of mass, that's the main thing that's sort of moving from one place to another within the box. And that kinetic energy would be 1 half mv squared. But we could also write that as 1 half we can break that v squared down into its components, vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. So there I'm using sort of the three-dimensional version of the Pythagorean theorem, um, that v squared equals vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. And so I could write this as 1 half mvx squared plus 1 half mvy squared plus 1 half mvz squared. So each of these one, two, three terms is this kind of a term that's referred to in the equipartition theorem, any term in the total energy of a system that's proportional to a velocity squared or position squared. These are three terms that are proportional to three different velocities that are each independent of one another. And so we could say that the average value of one half mvx squared, for example, the average value of that would be one half kbt according to the equipartition theorem. Questions so far? Okay, so in particular, if we double both sides of that, that means that mvx squared on the average is equal to kbt and I'll just scroll back up briefly and remind you that mvx squared average, that's what we had in our version of the ideal gas law. So I'm just gonna rewrite this down below that we showed from last time was that PV equals capital N times the average value of mvx squared, where again, capital N is the number of molecules in the box. But now we see, aha, I can substitute for that mvx squared, sorry, this should be mvx squared average. I can substitute kbt for it. So that's gonna give me PV equals n kbt. That looks a lot like the ideal gas law that you might be familiar with. PV equals little n capital RT, where little n is the number of moles, and that's equal to capital N, the number of molecules, divided by Avogadro's number, capital N sub capital A, 
which again is 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd. So substituting that in, we get PV equals capital N times R over N sub A times T. And comparing that with this version, we see, aha, they're identical if KB equals R over NA. So KB equals R over NA, or I could also write this R equals KB times NA. And it has a numerical value of 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. So when we write PV equals capital N KBT, I would call that the physicist version of the ideal gas law because physicists usually want to think about the individual molecules. But we could also write it as little n RT. That's kind of the chemist version of the ideal gas law because chemists want to think about moles. Allison. Um, I'm not sure if we're supposed to know this already, but what is the ideal gas law? Like, what is it used for? Uh, we're about to do some examples, so you're not supposed to know that already, but we're okay. about to, 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 to use it to do some examples and you'll do some more on the next homework. But basically, to answer your question in a less smarmy way, it, um, it's a way, it's a relationship between the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of a gas, depending on the number of molecules in the gas. But it's a good question, and we're about to try to give you some more intuitive understanding of it. But let's give it a two-star uh, box. OK, so let's do a couple of concept tests to illustrate this. Um, so concept test one. Say a box contains. Oh, wait a minute, before I do this, sorry. We're gonna to get to it, but I wanna say one other thing first, that this is a model. So when we derived this, we made the assumption that there were no collisions between the molecules. So we treated the collisions of molecules with the walls of the box, but no molecule to molecule collisions. That's more or less equivalent to saying that the volume occupied by the molecules is equal to zero. So that if the molecules are infinitesimal in size, of course, they would never collide with each other. So the first correction to the ideal gas law is to replace the volume by the volume of the box minus the volume occupied by the molecules. But that correction is hardly ever needed. The only time you need that is when the gas is under some very exotic situation where the pressure is really, really high, uh, <coughs> or equivalently, the density of the gas molecules is very high. So almost always, it works fine to just use the volume of the box. OK, so now we're ready for the concept test. So concept test one, a box contains cap N sub one molecules of nitrogen. So nitrogen is an N2 molecule and also cap N sub one molecules of oxygen, which is also a diatomic molecule. Is the pressure in the box make it multiple choice. A, cap N sub one KBT over V. B, two cap N sub one KBT or C, something else. All right, so I'm gonna randomly assign you to um, breakout rooms, and then I'll kind of circulate amongst you. Uh, 
Okay, so you should join your breakout room now and discuss this question amongst the other people there. Okay, uh, Scott, why don't you walk us through it? So uh, we have the equation from both PV equals NKBT. And for here, the N, the number of molecules, is going to be N1 plus N1 or 2N1 because we have one in one molecules of N2 and N1 molecules of O2. Uh, so if you write that out uh, and plug in the value of n that we have, uh, you get uh, PV equals 2n1 uh, kBT. And then if you divide both sides by V, you get V. Good. Um, very good. So uh, that's one good way to think about it. A different way is, remember, we're assuming no interaction between the molecules. And so you could also think of it as you get a factor N1 kBT over V of pressure just from the nitrogen molecules. But then on top of that, you get an additional pressure N1 kBT over V from the oxygen molecules and those two pressures that add together. So there, those are both good ways to think about it. It's helpful if you can think about it in e either way. Questions? Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the composition of air and then we'll do another concept test. So air is made up of 78% nitrogen molecules, meaning if you count the molecules, 78 out of every 100 molecules will be a nitrogen molecule. 21% oxygen, 1% argon, and, oh, I'm sorry, this is for dry air. So if you're out in the desert where there's essentially no water in the air and trace amounts of everything else, whoops. So things like neon and carbon dioxide occur at prevalences of much less than 1%. Um, however, um, and maybe I'm going to stop there. Um, <clears throat> let us now, um, no, no, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to keep on going. So air usually contains some water, some H2O molecules, and the world record for the most humid air 
is 15% of the molecules were H2O. So that's the absolute most you can ever get is 15%. Um, it's also important for the concept test that we're about to do and just thinking about gases in general to think about molecular weight, molecular weight, which is essentially the number of protons plus neutrons in the atom. The molecular weight does also take into account the mass of the electrons, but that's so much less than the mass of the protons and the neutrons that it's more or less negligible. And also the mass of a neutron is slightly different from the mass of a proton, but for our purposes, we can consider them to be the same. So, um, so um, the molecular weight of nitrogen is almost exactly 28. Of oxygen, it's almost exactly 16. Um, argon is about 40. Hydrogen, a single hydrogen atom has a molecular weight of one. A single oxygen atom has a molecular weight of 16. I'm sorry. Oxygen is not 16, please fix that. Oxygen is 32. So a single oxygen atom would be 16, an oxygen molecule is 32. And so then if you do the math on that, that means the molecular weight of, high, of water is uh, almost exactly 18. Okay. So now let's do concept test two. Um, in the baseball park in Arizona, the temperature, capital T, is higher than elsewhere. So I believe it is an open air baseball park and they play there and it gets pretty hot sometimes. Assuming the same water content of the air as let's say, um, let's say Philadelphia, but higher temperature in Arizona, why are more home runs hit in Arizona? So in answering this question, you need to not only think about the ideal gas law, but also think about some other things that we've been talking about. Maybe while I'm here, I'll give you a little bit of a hint that the average air pressure in Arizona has to be the same as the average air pressure here in Philadelphia, because if it weren't, the air would just be constantly blowing from Philadelphia to Arizona, let's say if the pressure were lower in Arizona. So the pressure has to be about the same. Pressure is the same on average between the two. Okay, so again, I'm gonna assign you to your breakout rooms and you should talk it over briefly there. <laughs> 
Okay, Ariana, can you walk us through it, please? Yeah, so if we're looking at PV equals N KBT, um, so you have P and then you divide by volume and you have P equals N KBT over V. Uh, and you know that in Arizona, the temperature is higher. And in order for the pressure to remain the same, that means another variable in the equation must change. Um, and volume, we're assuming that volume stays the same, so it must be the number of molecules that changes. So just to clarify, the reason that we can assume the volume stays the same is basically the volume of a st baseball stadium in Arizona is the same as in Philadelphia. I'm sorry, go ahead, say that last thing again. So, we, so that means N will change and the number of molecules will be lower to counteract the higher temperature. Um, mm -hmm. And then a smaller number of molecules will make it easier to hit a home run. Okay, why does it make it easier to hit a home run? There's less things in the way. I, yeah, I perfect. That. There's less things in the way. So there's fewer molecules that the baseball is going to collide with. Those molecules, although they're zipping all around, they they have no net average velocity, and so they're just creating an impediment to the movement of the baseball, because each time it collides with them, it slows down a little bit on average, and so having fewer of them allows the ball to fly further. Questions? Okay, if not, then let's do concept test number three. In Philadelphia, there are more home runs on days when the temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit and it's very humid than on days when temperature is again 90 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's less humid, so not as sticky. Why? So I'm gonna assign you to your breakout rooms again. Okay, go ahead. Okay. 
Quentin, can you walk us through it, please? Uh, yeah, so um, there are more home runs on uh, days where there's more uh, water molecules in the air. Um, the molecular weight of the water molecules is uh, less than the weight of the things it's taking up or taking the place of. So um, there's less air resistance uh, as the ball travels on the human okay. days. So in this case, when we write PV equals NKBT, the pressure, the volume, and the temperature are all the same. So that means that the total number of molecules in the stadium is the same, but a higher fraction of them. So when it's humid, we have a higher fraction of the molecules that are water. And that has a molecular weight of only 18 compared to 28 for nitrogen and 32 for oxygen, which make up most of the air. So the baseball is still colliding with the same number of molecules that move through the air, but they're lighter. And so they represent less impediment to its motion. They just get banged out of the way more easily. Other questions? Okay, so next we are going to return to the, so that's sort of as far as we're gonna go in class with the ideal gas law, again, on your next problem set, you'll have a chance to practice with it more. But now I wanna ask what else can we learn from the equipartition theorem? And in, to answer that question, I want to consider diatomic molecules. So we've talked about how air is mostly made up of diatomic molecules, nitrogen and oxygen. So they are quite important. The particular one that I want to talk about is hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric acid, which can exist as a gas. Um, and um, I just want to read this text that I got. This might be really old. I don't know when Kevin sent this, this text to me. Um, so the to answer your question, Kevin, to the velocity of the molecules depends on the mass as well as on the temperature uh, because it's the average kinetic energy that depends on the temperature. Okay, so the reason I wanna pick hydrogen chloride in particular is that that is one of the main molecules that Elmer Eims studied. And um, also it illustrates an important idea because the hydrogen and chlorine atoms have very different atomic weights. So we could model the hydrogen chloride molecule as a hydrogen atom and a chlorine atom. And I'm drawing the chlorine atom as much larger than the hydrogen atom because, um, because it is larger and it's way more massive. There is an equilibrium distance between these two atoms in the molecule. And so we know that anything that's in equilibrium, we can model the forces acting on it as a spring. So we'll model the force between them as a spring and let's say that there is an equilibrium distance between them R naught. So if we think about the relative motion of these two molecules, they can vibrate relative to one another. When that vibration happens, it's mostly going to be the hydrogen atom moving because it's so light compared to the chlorine. So the chlorine does vibrate a little bit. So I'll try to do the motion, but it's hard. I'm not that coordinated to do that. So the chlorine is moving slightly, but it's mostly the hydrogen moving. And in that vibration, the center of mass is not moving. So roughly, um, I don't know, let's see, do I have the atomic mass of chlorine? Uh, chlorine is 35. So this is 
atomic mass 35, this is atomic mass one. Roughly, where is the center of mass of the system? Somewhere in the chlorine atom? Yes. So almost all the mass is in the chlorine atom. So the center of mass is, is slightly off center from the chlorine atom. So remember, maybe this is not a reminder to you. If we look at the structure of an atom, there's the nucleus, which contains the protons and the neutrons. And let's say it has a diameter d, little d. And it's surrounded by this cloud of electrons that is much bigger. This is the electrons. And sort of, let's say the rate, the di diameter of the electron cloud is about D. The electrons are hugely bigger than the nucleus. So D over D is about 10,000, depends on the particular atom, but it's of order 10,000. So almost all the mass is in the nucleus almost all the volume is represented by the electrons. So the mass is really very, very concentrated near the center. You probably have heard about the Rutherford backscattering experiment, which was the first to show that. Okay, so the center of mass is close to the center of the chlorine atom, but slightly displaced towards the hydrogen atom. So mostly in this vibration, you have a motion of the hydrogen atom with a much smaller vibration of the chlorine atom so that the center of mass is not moving. So now let's think about writing the total energy of this molecule, the total of the molecule. Of course, this, the molecule can be moving through the volume of a box, let's say, so it has translational kinetic energy. So as before, one half mvx squared plus one half mvy squared plus one half mvz squared. We basically have already talked about that. But in addition to that, there is energy associated with this vibration relative to the center of mass. So let's call that, there's a kinetic energy. Let's think about that part of it first, associated with the vibration. And that's approximately equal to one half the mass of the hydrogen times the relative motion of the hydrogen atom squared, because almost all the motion is coming from the hydrogen. But there is a little bit that's also coming from the chlorine. So we're not going to show this in this class, but it turns out that the kinetic energy associated with that vibration is exactly given by 1 half mu v relative squared, where v relative is the time derivative, time derivative of this distance between them. Um, so just like when we say v sub x equals dx by dt, v relative would be dr by dt, time derivative of the distance between them. And mu is called the reduced mass. And that is defined to be the mass of the hydrogen times the mass of the chlorine over the mass of the chlorine plus the mass of the hydrogen. Now notice in the case that we're talking about where the mass of the chlorine is much greater than the mass of the hydrogen, that means that the denominator is approximately just equal to the mass of the chlorine because that hydrogen is a small correction. And so then I can cancel these two. And so the reduced mass is approximately equal to the mass of the hydrogen. If you were talking about a symmetrical molecule like a nitrogen molecule, then it would be in the numerator, mass of a nitrogen atom times the mass of a nitrogen atom. In the denominator, mass of a nitrogen atom plus the mass of a nitrogen atom. So it'd be m squared over 2m or m over 2. So there it would be a much bigger correction. Here it's a relatively small correction. Again, I haven't proven that to you. It doesn't matter that much for what we're doing here. However, in terms of the equipartition theorem, I'm going to rewrite for you the critical part of it. <clears throat> 
of the equipartition theorem, which was any term proportional to a velocity squared or a position squared. So this is definitely an example of a velocity squared. <clears throat> and so that means that the average value of this kinetic energy of vibration would uh, on average would be one half kBT. And so when I'm writing the total energy, I should add in this kinetic energy of vibration, which is one half mu V relative squared. <clears throat> there is also another kind of energy associated with that vibration though. What other kind of energy is there? Not just kinetic energy, but also Thermal? Well, we're talking about thermal energy in general. So yes, <clears throat> but the kinetic energy is part of the thermal energy. I'm talking about something sort of in the same category as kinetic energy. Potential. Potential energy. So when we stretch that spring, it builds up potential energy. So we would also have to add in the potential energy associated with the vibration, which I could write as one half K r minus r naught squared, where k is the spring constant associated with the spring we're using to model the force between them. And r minus r naught represents how much the string spring has been compressed or extended. So this is an example of a term in the total energy that's proportional to a position squared. And so on average, this would also equal one half kBT. So there'd be a half kBT of vibrational kinetic energy on average and a half kBT of vibrational potential energy on average. All right, so, so far we've talked about the motion of the center of mass. We've talked about the vibration. Is there some other way in which this diatomic molecule can move? So think about this molecule. We've talked about it can move like this, it can move like this. Is there some different way that it could move? I like the hand motion you're making, Marissa. How would you describe that? What word would you use? So Marissa's, if you can't see her, she's going like this with her fists. So I would call that a rotation, right? It can spin around various different axes. Like the vibration, the rotation is gonna occur around the center of mass. So let's talk about rotations. Just going to redraw our molecule here, the hydrogen and the chlorine. We said the center of mass is about here. So for example, it could rotate about this red axis. And so let's maybe let's call that the x-axis. And at some instant in time for that rotation, the hydrogen atom would be coming out of the page and the chlorine atom would be going into the page, but with a much smaller velocity because the rotation center is so close to the center of the chlorine atom. We can also have a rotation about an axis that's coming out of the page. So let's say here, this represents the Y axis, which is coming out of the page. And for that rotation, sorry, it took me a little while to, to figure out what I was talking about. For that rotation, for example, the hydrogen atom at some instant in time might be moving like this and the chlorine atom 
would be moving like that. And they're going in this circle around the center of mass like so. Now, those two rotations are really pretty much the same. So <clears throat> there's no real difference for a molecule like this between the y-axis and the x-axis. So x-axis and y-axis are equivalent. But there's a third axis that goes through the centers of both, both atoms, which we'll call the z-axis. That's really different. There, it's just spinning around that axis. That's really a very different motion from the other two. All right, so if we wanna write the kinetic energy of rotation, let's say around the x-axis, what's our expression for kinetic energy of rotation? I'm actually kind of glad that you guys are hesitating and responding here because hopefully that means that you've had a restful break in which you didn't think about physics very much, but time to think about physics a little bit more. So what's kinetic energy of rotation? What's our expression for that? Uh, Phoebe, you're muted. Um, one half I omega squared. Exactly, one half I omega squared. And just remind you that the I is like the angular version of mass and the omega is the angular version of velocity. So this is the angular version of one half mv squared. I'm gonna put subscripts on them because the moment of inertia depends on the axis. So the X and the Y axes are equivalent. So I sub X is gonna equal I sub Y. But for our next concept test, I want you to think about I sub Z. That's really different. Is that going to be greater than or less than I sub X? So I don't think we're going to do the, the breakout rooms because we're starting to run out of time. So just think about that on your own for a moment. Okay, who would like to take a stab at this one? Let's start with what's the basic uh, equation for determining moment of inertia. I equals, maybe I'll, I'll write it down for you, mass times the average value of the square of R, where R is the distance from the axis. And remember, we're doing that averaging by mass. So we're breaking it up into little equal masses and then taking the average values of R squared. So which one has a bigger average value of R squared? rotations around the z-axis or around the x-axis. X. How come? How can you tell? Because for the x-axis, the whole, the hydrogen would swing around. But yeah. The z-axis still just. Yes, exactly. So for the x-axis, the hydrogen atom at least is pretty far away from it. For the z-axis, the axis is going right through the nuclei. And remember, almost all the mass is in the nuclei. So in fact, the average value of r squared for the z rotations is tiny compared to the other ones. And so i sub z is much, much, much less than i sub x, which is equal to i sub y. So that's where we're going to leave it for today. Next time, we'll explore what are the implications for that in terms of the physical properties of molecules like this. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.